This evening we're looking at fundamentals and technicals. This is number, if my DUFL would work, 11 in the series. The other 10 all exist, uh, just one lap.com slash bootcamp. Um, we've obviously run in a process and a theory to it, but some of them, particularly if you're coming in new to the process, you might want to jump to a few of them. It's designed to pretty much start at the top and go the way down. And, and what I say, what's on the website is we record these sessions. So these sessions are all there. If you want to refresh, if you've come late to the process and you want to go catch up on some of the others, they are all available there. Uh, this is number 11. Next, year, next month will be number 12. We're doing risk risk management and the like, um, and then we'll kick off with something new starting in July. But this boot camp was a 12-process was a boot camp that, that, that we've run, run through in, in, in the process. So this evening, technicals, fundamentals, and this is a comment that many people have heard, I've never met a rich technician. In other words, all the fund managers, or as we like to call them, fund damages, because they lose your money and they damage your fun will tell you that they've never met a, re a rich technician. In other words, they'll tell you they've never met a rich trader or a rich uh, 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 person who uses charts. Um, and that's true, because unless you've met Soros, you haven't. But in truth, unless you've met Buffett, you also haven't met a rich, rich asset manager. And further to that, most, a lot of asset managers make their money not from their investment, but from the fees that they charge. The bigger picture is there's this argument, this fight that goes on between on the one side the fundamental people and on the other side the technicians, the chartists, the traders. And it's like never, you know, they have to hate each other. They have to be on other sides of the fence. Never can the two meet. And I think like most fights, it's completely stupid. And I think <clears throat> that there's a lot that we can take from each other and, and, and really, really benefit from it. And a lot of this evening will perhaps be more valid towards a investment strategy more than a trading strategy, but it can be worked back into a trading strategy too. <coughs> and the point being is that if we're, if we you know, what are we doing when we, we put money at risk, i.e. we put money in the market, whatever our methodology is, what we're in essence doing is, is we are taking that risk based on some probabilities and we're trying to get wind at our back. You know, we're trying to get things slightly in our favor. So you go in the direction of the market and, and you, you manage your, all of that sort of thing. And surely we've got to say that charts can give something to the, to the, to the fundamentalist and that fundamentals can give something to the trader. Um, I, I've got a friend who, who manages a, a, a unit trust and he was buying Grinrod from, I don't know, 16, 17 Rand all the way down to 9 Rand and eventually he capitulated. And at the time, at 16 Rand, I'm saying to him, dude, look at the chart. Don't buy this thing. He's like, ah, chart smart, couldn't be bothered. Uh, his fund would be better off if he had just looked at a chart and saw this thing is falling off a cliff. You know, wait for it to stop falling off the cliff and then buy it. Easier said than done. But, you know, the flip is I think a lot of folks perhaps would have been better off if instead of just, you know, looking at the chart of African Bank, mm, maybe a bad example, um, I had a small gander at some of the fundamentals at the same time. In other words, and I'm not saying we need to be absolute pros in both, but I think there certainly is something to be said for bits of each. And, and, and to the flip side, I appreciate certainly in, in, in a lot of my trading systems, I'm purely price or chart driven. In essence, there's many ways to do this process, and I think we need to find what makes sense for us and ultimately what makes profit for us. So the differences are quite simple. Technical analysis, uh, two main approaches. Broadly, those are your two main approaches. The third, I suppose, would be coin tossing. Technical analysis looks at price move. It uses this to determine a potential future price. Typically short-term, typical trader. Now, to me, short-term, anything less than three years. A position that is less than three years is short term. Three to sort of 10 is medium, 10 plus is long term. So typically we're talking short term here. Fundamentals looks at the economic data, not necessarily the, 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 the country economic, but of the particular stock. And then does the same thing to determine a future price move. Typically longer term, typically your fund managers. Uh, here the longer term is perhaps gets, gets blurred. I think there are very few asset managers, fund managers out there who are holding much for 10 plus years. I think there's a lot of churning going on. They have a benefit. If we churned, if we take one of the top funds out there and, and pick whichever one you want, I'm agnostic as to which, but if we take that and we did the level of transacting that they did, we would get killed by tax. But because they do it within a hedge fund or collective investment scheme, they don't pay tax. So we get taxed, we buy it when we sell, we get taxed on profit. 
And that's a significant advantage to the fund manager. So when we are doing our long-term investing in our personal capacity, we churn a lot less because of that tax implication. If we are regularly buying and selling within three years, SARS says you're trading, instead of paying CGT, you now pay your marginal tax rate, which has significant implications. The point being is, neither is perfect. You know, each side would tell you that theirs is the way, the light, and the only thing that matters. But as I said, as often the case is, it's, it's not the case. And, and, and they both have their limitations. They both have uh, 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 restrictions in them. Um, and then it comes to what about putting them together? Can't we blend them so that we get the two together and we take the benefits of both? And it's something which I used to do. Back in the early 2000s, I would do the process. And then at some point... I can't, and I, I probably know when it was. I spent almost two years, 20 odd months day trading, um, 05, 06. And probably at that point, I moved away from it. And putting this presentation back to, together, I went back to my, my notes from that period of, of, of trading. And, and I used to keep very, very good notes, um, a trading journal in a sense. And, and I think I missed a trick. And I, I, I need to go and spend a lot more time on this. But I was looking at some of the trades. And I mean, I had some, you know, and, and maybe, maybe it's hindsight bias. I mean, I need to go and do better. But I mean, I, I bought Grinrod at, at 13 and it went to 60. And I bought Anglo Platinum at 250 and it went to, to 1500. Um, and I haven't done that in a while. Now, maybe I could blame the market. Maybe it's me. I'm going to go and dig around. So technically, we say technicals is your shorter term. And we typically say technicals is easier. We say charting, technical analysis is easier. You know, you pick up a chart. I, I always do what I call my 6% rule. I show, sorry, my six-year-old rule. I, my niece is six years old. I show her a chart as I say, is, is it going up or down? And she can in a split second tell me up or down, or sometimes she says not sure, in which case it's going sideways. So we say technical analysis is a lot easier. I, I agree with it, but I have some skepticism to it. I think maybe it's easier because we, you know, we, we, we kind of say, well, we know what an RSI is, we know what a MACD is, uh, we can draw a straight line to do a support or resistance. Hey, we are a trader, we are a chartist. I think there's probably a heck lot more to it. And I think if we speak to people such as Mishima Gama, Petri Radenhaus, uh, 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 Goth McKenzie, um, those folks, uh, Warren Peacock, who are traders and have been traders for you know, a decade or more, they will say to you, yeah, it's actually a lot harder. And the fact that it's easy is borne out by the fact that in many times we then get our money disappears from our account. Not because someone swapped it, but because we, we weren't skilled. It's got an appearance of being easy perhaps more than actually is easy. And that appearance is because if you want to know a fair value of a stock, I'm going to say to you, cool, fair value of a stock. Uh, discounted cash flow is by far the most popular methodology used. And uh, yeah, do a CA, come back in three or four years and you'll understand DCF. And you're like, yo. You, know, you want to know if a stock's going up or down, you log on to IG, you load a chart, you put a 200 day moving average or an 80 or a 60 or whatever. And a minute later, you're in business. So I'm not convinced by the easier. Fundamental, certainly, as a longer-term view, certainly, there's a lot more to learn there. But, I mean, don't get me wrong. I am the internal lazy person. My fundamentals are not hard work. I have no fancy degrees to back up any of my fundamentals, etc. Uh, a lot of it's been trial and error, as has been my trading. And I've probably put equity time into each of them over the last 20 odd years that I've had portfolios um, into, into skilling myself into both areas. The key point is, is that fundamentals is the, can give you a theoretical price. Technicals is telling you what's happening right now. So fundamentals can tell you, what's an example? Fundamentals can tell you, uh, what's a cheap stock in our market right now? I can't for the life of me think of one. Um, I'm going to go with Santova. Complete disclosure, I'm going with Santova because I own Santova and because I want the price to go higher because it's stuck at four bucks. So the fundamentals will tell you that Santova is worth five rand ten. Uh, Anthony Clark will tell you 5.20. Keith McLachlan will tell you 5.05. So it's somewhere around five rand and some change. And that's the fundamentals and that's cool and probably it will play out and probably Santova, all things equal which it never is, Centover will probably overshoot the value because they do and it'll hit six rand or there's about. The question is this year or in 20 years time? Because in 20 years time, it's a, it's a bad return. This year, it's a great return. Um, 
So the fundamentals play out, but they play out over the longer term. Whereas the technicals are playing out over a much shorter term. The technicals are those sudden news breaks that are happening, the bigger uh, geopolitical story, the bigger economic stories that are happening. So a quality company, you can say, look, it's one, three, and five-year valuation targets are higher, but in the short term, it might go lower because that's what markets do. In the short term, they're crazy. In the long term, they tend towards its fundamental value. Used together, fundamentals identify the stock, technicals identify the timing. And it comes back to the Grinrod story I mentioned. Um, it's not that Grinrod isn't a good company. It's not that Grinrod perhaps, yeah, uh, so Grinrod has cash and has a, 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 a tangible net asset value of about seven rand a share, I think, um, or maybe it's six rand a share. Uh, so when you're buying it at 14 or 15, you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm playing twice tangible net asset value. And a lot of that tangible net asset value is the 2 billion rand they got from Ramgro when they took a stake. So this is, this is real hard cash. Okay, a lot of it is the ships on the sea, which are going to be hard to sell, but you write them down to zero. The point being is you've got a tangible half of the market cap, half the price you're paying is in real tangible things. It, on the surface looks attractive. There's a good story to Grinrod. We can argue that. And I, know, I appreciate the, if you say Grinrod is a commodity play, the good story is not there for Grinrod. But nonetheless, but if the market is selling it down for whatever reason, why stand in the way? You know, the best stock in the world at times is going to go lower. And if the stock is going lower, why stand in the way? Stand back. Let it go lower. It, it might be a great company. You've identified it as a brilliant company that ultimately you want to hold. Whether you want to do it geared or ungeared, we'll touch on it in a bit. It's a great company you want to hold. Can we maximize the entry point? And I'm being careful with the word maximize. We're never going to get it perfect. And I'm using Grinrod as an extreme example. And I've got a chart coming up in the moment which will complicate the issue, make it a heck lot grayer in, 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 in essence and, and, and confuse the issue a whole lot more. So we blend the two because technicals ignores fundamentals, fundamentals ignores technicals. We blend the two together, uh, do we get lower risk? I think we do. I think we can, we can bring it lower risk. In the simplest sense, we won't be going long busted stocks. I mean, a, you know, a dead cat bounce. Any stock can bounce at some point. But if a stock is fundamentally busted or insanely overvalued and it's falling down, we're not going to be buying it until it gets to a more reasonable price point. Inverses, we're not going to be short. You know, the number of people who have gone bust shorting two shares, Naspass and Capitec. And the rule with Naspass and Capitec is quite simple. Don't short them. I mean, is there money to be made in shorting Naspass and Capitec? Sure, absolutely there is. There's also money to be made, you know, jumping off the 12th story of a building and selling the video on YouTube. It's just not a desirable way to make money. Everyone will tell you Naspass is expensive, short it. Uh, you know, is it expensive? Forget that. The point is the share's going up. And you don't stand in front of a train and say, stop, Mr. Train. No, it's just going to weigh you over. Not interested in the story at all. So we can manage that process. You don't want to trade every stock. One of the things I talk about, and I've spoken about it in the earlier presentations in this series, has been you don't want to open up JSC, open your IG account, and there are 450 potential shares that you can trade, and start at A. In fact, you start at 1 for one time, okay, suspended, so you go to A, and move all the way through to Z. I don't think we have any Zs at the moment. It used to be Zeptronics and ZCI, but nonetheless, you look at every single chart in the market. That's not going to work. That is just, that's never going to work. It's, it's bringing in too much complexity. It's bringing in too much uh, yeah, human error. You're just going to get tired. At some point, you're going to start seeing, you know, all sorts of crazy things in your charts. I don't know, dancing dodos and the like. Um, so what you want is to narrow down a list. I always said to folks, well, how do you do that? Well, start with the top 40 and pick a bank. Pick a diversified industrial, pick a diversified miner, pick a retailer food, pick a retailer clothing, pick a healthcare, pick a property. Now you've got seven stocks. Okay, but that's, you know, which bank? Then everyone says to me, which bank? Well, we've got six banks. We've got uh, the big four, Investec and Capitec. Which of those six? Well, couldn't we run a simplish fundamental process through it and say, that one of the six? 
So instead of basically randomly choosing, we have said, our preferred of the six banks is Capitec. Disclaimer, I own it. So now we've got a stock, but we used a bit of thought behind how we decided that that would be the stock that we traded. And maybe that says, if we think that Capitec's fundamentally a quality company, that goes expensive at time, yes, but fundamentally a quality company, and I'm going to come to that in more detail in a moment. Doesn't that then say also, we don't short this share? In other words, we're only taking long positions. We're only looking to profit from upside moves. Now, I've spoken before, again, in an earlier boot camp, number three, margin, risk, and leverage. I've spoken before about going short. Going short is fraught with horrible things, like losing money. The, idea, the problem with short, when things fall, they fall violently. Go look at a chart or something that fell. They also don't fall in a straight line. They'll go down 12% and the next day they'll go up 6 and you get stopped out. And then they go down 15 but you got stopped out. So, I mean, I do very, very, the only place I go short is Aussie Futures. I don't short equities. I, only place I go short. Because, yeah, when you get shorting right and everything goes perfect, oh, you make some money. But it just so seldom goes right because the volatility spikes, the, the, the moves get bigger, you keep on getting stopped out, you're having to re-enter, re-entries, cost of trade, cost of spread, etc. And then what happens in a period like 2008, you're saying, oh, but there's money to be made. But in 2008, if you're not shorting, trust me, in 2008, you weren't getting buy signals either. You actually moved to cash. And because of a global financial crisis, what happens? Interest rates go up. So if you sat in cash for a year over the crisis of 08, 09, you earned 15% in your equity in your portfolio, while markets were down 30 or 40%. You outperformed by 50 odd percent by doing nothing. That is a humongous, humongous number. Would you have made 40 or 50% by shorting? Maybe, perhaps. But you can, you know, you outperform just by moving to cash. And that's broadly my strategy in the whole shorting space. I don't short typically. I just go to cash. I park my money there. What's important is keep your time frames in sync. So don't go and take a long fundamental view. Sorry, it's video two, margin, leverage, and exposure. Don't take a long fundamental view and then go trade a one-hour chart. If you're taking a fundamental view, you're taking a multi-year view. Ideally, you want to use at least a weekly chart. And then we're starting to bring into the question, hang on, are we still trading here? And, and that gets blurry, certainly, as I said, within three years. But you know what, if I'm in a trade, and it, even if it's a trade and it runs forever and a day, if, it wants to, if, if, if what I own wants to go up for five years, I'm not one to argue. It, it doesn't often happen, but if it wants to, I'm going to be in the bus. But I'm going to come back to that a whole bunch as well. But certainly, make your charts longer. Even daily, I think, is way too short. I think weekly charts is probably the minimum. Monthly charts, I mean, the short answer is I doubt many of us have the patience for monthly charts. Now, I, I can tell you monthly is best, but if no one's got the patience for that, let's not pretend we do, so let's accept it. And then it is a case of reducing gearing. You can't go into a trade that might run for an age on a seven or six times geared investment. Because there's a cost there. What happens when it goes sideways for three or four weeks, or maybe three or four months, which it might do? What happens if it drops 10% or so, which in a big picture it might do? So you need to reduce that gearing level. We reduce the gearing level one or two ways. We go straight to equity rather than derivative. Or we, you know, they might say you can buy uh, 10,000 shares, but you only buy 2,000. In other words, you don't max out. And that's where we talk about that a lot in video two. If you go to boot camp there, you'll find it. Uh, this is not my fancy pen. It's yours. That's why you stop taking notes. <laughs> um, so we've got to get them in sync. That's critically important. I think that's perhaps the major issue, is that we've got to get the two in sync. The fundamentals and the charts need to come into sync. So what are we looking for? We're looking for strong sectors. We're looking for moats, growth potential. We're looking for competition. Understand competition is good. A, a sector that doesn't have competition is frankly ripe for disruption. You know, you look at an industry that has 20%, 30% margins or something, um, and you know that there are other people out there saying, okay, they're making 30% margin. If I made 15% margin, I undercut them and they get blown out the water. 
So you want competition. We've got companies like Richmond who run on insane margins. I get that. But it's a highly, even at that high level, it's a massively competitive sector. The whole luxury sector is exceedingly competitive. So in truth, competition is not bad. Moats are those things that defend you from competitors. They're great. They're hard to identify. And they are, I think, becoming easier to breach with technology. But maybe that's a confirmation bias. You know, and, and we use, I'm going I'm to use Airbnb. You know, they now have more bed nights than, than Marriott, the biggest hotel chain in the world. They don't own a hotel. They don't own anything. They don't even own the offices they operate out of in San Francisco. They rent it. But that might be confirmation by it. Every generation thinks that the music is terrible. No, everyone thinks that their kids' music is terrible. Um, you know, and if you haven't yet thought that your kids' music is terrible, it's going to happen. And when you were a kid, your parents hated the music and you called them old codgers. Um, you were right. They were old codgers. Point is, now you're the old codger. To the youngins in the audience, it's going to happen to you. Trust me. Um, I didn't even have kids and it's happened to me. The growth potential to it. And I'm going to delve into a lot more, so we'll park it there. But essentially identified technically strong stocks within a sector. What do we do far too often as human beings? We go find the busted sector and we go find the busted stock, right? Because if that stock rises and rushes off, man, we're going to make so much money, we're going to be able to retire by Friday. The point is, it never does, does it? Occasionally it does. But you took massive outside, outside risk. You went and found the worst possible sector. You went and found the worst possible share, and you bought it. And frankly, you made money, you were lucky, because 99 times out of 100, you're going to lose it. The analogy is you go to the horse races. And 50 meters before the end, they freeze the race. And they say, place your bet. What do you do? You go place your bet on the horse that's number one, maybe number two. If you want to be really brave, you place the bet on the horse number three. You don't go back to the start gate where the horse passed out and never left the box. You think it's dead, but hey, you know, the odds are 1,000 to 1. And you put your money on that because there's a chance that it's not dead. And there's a chance that it stands up and runs. And there's a chance that the other 19 horses all fall down dead. And that this horse wins. It's not impossible, right? It's just not likely. Winning stocks, winning sectors. What do winning stocks, winning sectors typically keep on doing? Winning. For a couple of reasons. Firstly, they know how to win. Half of beating Hussein Bolt is believing you can beat Hussein Bolt. In fact, no, probably... You get the point. If you go there on the day and you think you can't beat him, you're not going to beat him. Half of the game is knowing how to win. Also, when you're the winner, you can bully your competitors. So ShopRite, random example, I own ShopRite shares. ShopRite uh, has a 6% operating margin. Pick and Pay has a 2% operating margin. That gives ShopRite 4% to beat Pick and Pay over the head with. ShopRite's going to do it. Absolutely, they're going to do it. They're the dominant player. They're going to abuse their dominance. Now, they're not going to, you know, competition authorities can stay where they are. But they're going to as far as they can abuse it. And when Pick and Pay does a discount special, they've got 4% extra fat. They can go make a better, you know, Pick and Pay's got milk for 19 rand. Man, our milk is 17.99. They're the winner. They're the dominant player. They typically carry on winning. And at some point, yes, at some point they become, it, it's, once upon a time, Pick and Pay was the dominant player. And then they started to believe their own story. They stopped being aggressive. They paid out massive dividends instead of investing in infrastructure. You saw their margins starting to come under pressure. You saw ShopRite spending vast amount on CapEx, whereas Pick and Pay was spending nothing on CapEx. And you think, well, what are they spending the CapEx on? What well, was distribution centers? And that's why ShopRite's been killing Pick and Pay for the last 10 or 15 years, distribution centers. So we want the strong sectors, we want the strong stocks. So how do we identify that? Porter wrote a book in the 1980s on management strategy called Porter's Five Forces. Do not read the book, it will hurt your head in a bad way. 
it'll hurt your head in pure out and out boredom. But he did have a few points that were quite valuable, and frankly, that instead of the book, that's the picture that cares. So his was a management strategy book. But what does it tell us? How do we identify strong companies? So competitive rivalry within an industry, critically important. Bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of customers, threat of new entrants, and threat of substitute products. And I t this would add legislative risk. What I mean by legislative risk, let's look at healthcare. Healthcare is undoubtedly a great place to be, right? We are living longer. We are also richer. We also have more rich people diseases, which are all curable. So we are going to spend more as a, as a percentage of our, of our net wealth over our lifetime on healthcare than any other generation, as has been the trend. There's a problem with healthcare. Governments around the world, not just South Africa, America, UK, Europe, governments around the world are very concerned by the cost of healthcare. They are concerned that healthcare costs are getting out of control. So what are they doing? Legislating. We've seen it in South Africa already, single exit pricing on, 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 on pharmaceuticals. Of course, clicks comes along and makes a killing on single exit pricing. But the legislation concerns me. So where do you go in the hospital space? Generics. Aspen. Because what do governments want to do? Cut costs. Who cuts your costs? The generic manufacturer. So let's quickly look at some sectors. Banks. So, bargaining power of suppliers. Well, who's a supplier to a bank? I mean, it's your IT and infrastructure and stuff like that. I'm not sure there's much bargaining power, really. Bargaining power of customers. We have ultimate bargaining power. We can move. So who here likes their bank? Okay, yeah. Who here changed banks in the last year? Okay. So four of you didn't like your bank and changed. The rest of you didn't like your bank and didn't change. It's not that we can't change. It's that moi, hoi, hoi, hoi. Have you tried to change? And I changed banks, and the bank that I was moving to promised that it would be everything would be fine. It would be a seamless process. Nine years later, I still have a debit going off my own bank account because no one seemingly in the face of the universe can move it. It was not seamless. It was messy. And it was, it was exceedingly messy. We don't do it. So we do have the power. In the corporate space, there's a lot more power, of course. I'm not talking about corporate banking. I'm talking about deals and stuff. You want to do a merger, you need some bankers to advise you. You get four different bankers to come and talk, and you pick one of them. There, it's highly competitive. But at eye level, it's not competitive particularly much. Uh, threat of new entrants, yes and no. So the trick with being a new entrant is that you don't just say, hey, I'm starting a bank, boom, boom. Here's Simon's fantastic bank. No, no. You go to the reserve bank and say, I want to open a bank. And they probably say no the first 5,000 times you ask. The 5,000 and first time that you ask, they give you a pile of documents that stretches from here to Pretoria, and they say, cool, fill these in and come back. And you do that and you come back and they say, cool, we need a, mi a billion rand in cash. It's not easy. So I mean, we had a banking boom, late 90s, early 2000s, second tier banks, most didn't make it. Our most recent bank that started, ironically African bank, they relaunched, but let's not count them. Uh, to my memory, it's Capitec, 2001. There are undoubtedly some, some specialized banks, and I'm not talking those, I'm talking a mass market. To my knowledge, it's Capitec, 2001. No new banks in 15 years. So, threat of new entrants, not really at all. Threat of substitute products. Yeah, okay, so, I mean, what are the threat of substitute products? Bitcoin, blockchain, M-Pesa. Ironically, so M-Pesa was a massive hit in Kenya. So, Vodafone did it in Kenya, huge hit. Voda, Vodacom, who's the child of Vodafone, did it locally in South Africa, shut it down last week. Why? Because we actually have a massively high level of banked populace in this country. Thanks pretty much exclusively to Capitec, but nonetheless, we have a very, very high percentage of, of, of banking clients in this country. So are there going to be new entrants? Are we, are we going to see a standard charter come in and offer retail banking? I don't think so. Are we going to see a pure online bank? 2020, Christo Duval started. In fact, maybe 2020 was after Capitec. Are we going to see something like that happening? Maybe. That, that may be it. Are we going to see a lot of them? No. 
But if we get a 2020 coming, what's 2020 going to do? Compete on price. Well, sure, but Capitec, asterisk means I own it. Capitec has that pretty much locked up. So will Capitec suffer? They're not going to go and compete against Capitec. They're going to compete against Standard Bank, Investec, Barclays Africa Group, uh, Nedbank. Uh, who did I leave out? Standard Bank. No. FNB. They're going to go and compete against the high price guys. Just for example, I pay 285 Rand per month for my bank account, and I could get a one world account at Capitec. I think they put the price up to 5 Rand 80. I don't know why I pay 285 either. I, 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 yeah, at some point, I'm going to wake up, smell the coffee, and save 280 Rand a month. I'm sure I get something that I might not get at Capitec. I'm pretty sure it's not worth 280 Rand. But this is what we're doing to Id identify the sectors and then perhaps to say within the sector which are the ones that interest us most. Let's go to telcos. MTN, Vodacom, Telcom, those are the only listed. Of course, we've also got uh, uh, Sol C locally. Blue Label, I didn't put in there. Some people will call them a Telcom, but for this process, I'm not. So, bargaining power of suppliers, not too bad. Uh, let's go to legislative risk. Well, we've already seen what legislative risk has done. I mean, two words, MTN Nigeria. We've also seen, and let's take that off the table, let's pretend that that's not a normal occurrence. That was MTN trying to bully their regulator. Let's look at the uh, 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 least cost, uh, what are they? Mobile termination rates, which used to make a fortune of profit for MTN and Vodacom and are frankly disappearing off the face of the earth. So the legislation, in our case, ICASA, said, you know what, guys, you're ripping off consumers. We need to change this. And they have. They've basically forced the hand. Why? Because you have a state license. ICASA is your, is your, is your controller. And if, it, you know, if, you don't, if you don't make ICASA happy, look what happened when, when they didn't make their equivalent, the Nigerian Communication Commission, and Nigeria happy. We don't know how that's going to shake out, but it's not going to be pretty or cheap. So legislative, very much real there. Bargaining power of customers. So they're very clever. What do they do? They sell you a phone. No, rephrase that. They give you a phone, which they then charge you for over the next two years, and you can't leave. But at the end of the two years, you can leave. What I did back, it was 2010 or 2011. I can't remember which. So I'd been with, Vodac I'd been with Vodacom since August 1994. I finally pull the plug and I go off contract, I buy a phone, right? Really old fashioned, I get it. But I went and bought a Google Nexus. Back then we were probably in Nexus 3, I'm not sure. Anyway, bought the Google phone. And I then port, so I, I, I used Vodacom as a pay as you go for a month or two. I then ported to MTN, I then ported to Telcom, and I then ported to Cell C. So over a period of about eight or 10 months, I spent time on every network. For me, it was important. There are a couple of locations that I need really good quality data and voice. I need it in Santon because of events here in the JSC. I need it where I live. I need it at the v &A waterfront in Durban because that's, sorry, Cape Town. That's where I do presentations. I needed it at the point at Rosebank because that's where other people I work with. Yeah, there were a couple of, so I used the various different networks. My favorite network without a shadow of a doubt was Cell C because my phone didn't ring for two months. <laughs> It was brilliant, just like nothing happened for two months. So I went across all four networks, and at the end, for me, the best was MTN. So I went to MTN, nice and simple, got my phone, everything's lovely, do the pay as you go. Threat of new entrants? No. ECAS is not going to give a fifth license. But threat of substitute products, they are dying. They are dying. Average revenue per user, ARPU, which both MTN and Vodacom used to trumpet as the best thing ever. If you notice, they no longer mention ARPU. Well, they actually, ironically, they both did in their last set of, of their last updates. But they hadn't mentioned ARPU for three years. Why? Because average revenue per user is going down. An SMS effectively charges you 3,000 Rand per megabyte. 3,000 Rand per megabyte. When I got my first phone that had capability of doing data, I was paying 2,000 Rand a gig. I know about 10 gigs a month, it cost me 420 Rand. And that's just over, that's probably a 12-year period the price has crashed. It's worse than that. 
so I tried to send an SMS the other day, and my phone said to me, you can't send SMSs, you don't have this on your plan. I'm like, what do you mean? I've had this plan for 14 months. Turns out I haven't sent an SMS in 14 months. Because if you're on an iPhone, you're using iMessage, and if you're not, you're using WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp is killing them. But then it gets even more scary. So my sister was in Bangladesh this week. So in the olden days, I would have phoned her, right? I would have had to go to my white pages, find the country code for Bangladesh, the city code for her hotel. No, I phoned her via WhatsApp. So I used WhatsApp to do WhatsApp to WhatsApp call. Completely secure, so no one can listen in. No one wants to listen in to me and my sister, but nonetheless. Um, <laughs> The best part was it was free. It wasn't cheap. It was free. Why? Because I'm at my home Wi-Fi where I pay a set fee for monthly ADSL and my sister's on our hotel Wi-Fi which is included in her room rate. I can still remember phoning London in the 80s and paying about two rand a minute. This is the 80s, uh, not 2016. In the 80s, two rand was money. I can now phone my sister for free. And the line quality is Perfect. Absolutely. I was, I, I was, I was chatting with a, a, a journalist. He's in Cape Town. So he phones me mobile to mobile this afternoon. And we're chatting and he says, I'm going to phone you back. And he phoned me back on WhatsApp. The WhatsApp was better than mobile to mobile. The data network was better than voice network. So these guys are complaining like heck. Are they not? They are giving all shades of trouble. They're trying to, they want WhatsApp to pay money. Of course, WhatsApp doesn't make money, so they can't pay money. They are deeply unhappy with this. And we haven't even mentioned things such as Skype and all the other bits and pieces out there. Um, something my colleague and I use is something called Slack. So Slack is now bringing in voice messaging as well. And the, the point is, it's not a case of, you know, it, does it exist? It's which platform do you want to use? Some people want to do Skype, some WhatsApp, some whatever it might be. So these guys are on a hiding. Ultimately, what are they? They will become utilities. Utilities aren't a bad thing. So what, utility, water, electricity. Now, I'm not going to say that, that, that the ability to communicate is a requirement for life, such as water and electricity, but I'm going to say that it's going to be something which will be abundant and incredibly cheap. And that's fine, because you know what it costs to make a bit of data? Zero. It costs nothing. It costs to build the stand, the mast, to which they communicate. Yes, there is an initial capex fee. And we're about to get 5G rolling out. 5G can do gigabit internet. At that point, I think we've kind of maxed out our speed requirement. You know, anything above gigabit internet, basically you're going to be able to download the whole internet in a day. And that's too many cat videos for anybody. <coughs> so they're going to have their base done. Yes, there'll be some places in Santon and stuff where they'll carry on, but broadly their, their capex spend is done, and they just charge you tiny margins because every cent above zero is profit for them. But they're not there yet. And between now and then is going to be massive, massive amounts of pain. So I was a very long-term holder for MTN. I sold 24 December last, uh, October last year when the Nigerian story broke. But to me, that was a catalyst. I was looking at this sector and saying, this is not a sector that I think is the best place in the world to be. I would rather have be holding WhatsApp or Facebook or Alphabet, Google, whatever the case may be, than the dumb pipe. No, I mean, we love the dumb pipe, but it, at, at these valuations, it's not a price strategy. And then food retail. I hold Woolies and ShopRite. We hate our banks and we're going to have a bank account until we die. We're going to eat until we die too. The beauty is we might love our retailer. And it's, so let's look at ShopRite quickly. Bargaining power of suppliers. Zero bargaining. So you supply baked beans. YT Basson comes and says, Sir, I would like a million tins of baked beans. Uh, I want it on Thursday. I want you to deliver it 10 minutes past 10, and I will pay you in August. Ah, you blinked. I'll pay you in August. Ah, he's got the deal. Because you know what? YT Basson buys more baked beans than anyone else, and if you're not going to supply it, he'll supply it. And is there a difference between Ku and all gold? Ah, may, I don't know. Maybe. I, I No. Baked beans are baked beans, eh, really? So he's got all the power. And they really do. They pay at 90 or 120 days. 
In other words, they sell the product, they've got the cash, they earn the interest for three, four months before they pay you. Because White Deep Sun is not silly. If, he, if he's going to sell a tin of baked beans on Saturday, he wants it in his warehouse on Thursday, the shop on Friday, your larder on Saturday. None of this keeping stock, and he's got distribution centers, not to hold stuff, just to funnel stuff. It all comes in, it all goes out. Bargaining power of customers. We have perfect bargaining power, right? Because we can go somewhere else. We don't have to shop at ShopRite. We can go to Checkers. Oh, hold on, he owns Checkers. We can go to YouSave. Hmm, owns YouSave too. We can go to Pick and Pay, doesn't own Pick and Pay. So we can go somewhere else. So what do they do? A couple of things. Firstly, they put a shop on every corner. And they cannibalize their own business. But nonetheless, they put a shop on every corner. They try and build loyalty. So Pick and Pay has the smart shopper card. So I can't shop at Pick and Pay. Two reasons. One, you note, I'm not a shareholder, so I'm not going to shop at Pick and Pay. More importantly, when I do shop there, they say, are you a smart shopper? And I have to say, no. Which means I'm a stupid shopper, right? <laughs> so the smart shopper is clever. Pricing. But the key thing is, it's about price, it's about perception. So everyone tells you Pick and Pay's got terrible service. I don't know if that's true or not, but that is the perception out there. So we do have the bargaining power, but it's tough. And we do get stuck in our rituals. So my household, it's easy. I shop at Woolies, my, shop, my wife shops at uh, ShopRite. And when she shops at Pick and Pay, she changes the packets. Threat of new entrants. So Walmart tried with MassMart, so far success B0. I remember interviewing Wati Basson. I call him Mr. Basson, I can't call him Whitey. I remember interviewing him when, when, Mass Mart was, when Walmart was coming in, and I said to him, ignorantly as it turns out, I said, so do you think there's some lessons that the Americans in Walmart can teach us? And he laughs heartily, I mean proper, I mean like a proper belly laugh. He's a short man, he leans back, he laughs, he laughs, he laughs, he sits forward. He says, I'll bet you 10 rand we'll teach them lessons. Yep, so far I owe him 10 bucks. <coughs> Choppies. Nice try, but no chance. You need nationwide distribution. So you've got nationwide advertising. So you've got nationwide, you know, choppies have got a little bit here and a little bit there, and then the corridor between here and Gaborone. Uh. But then we get to, so new entrants in the small scale, yes. Are we going to see a Tesco or someone come in? They're going to do what Walmart did. They're going to come in via acquisition. They're not going to come in greenfields. Substitute products? Sure, online. If you look at the retail sales in the US, and the retail results in the US in the last couple of weeks, they have been uniformly abysmal. One exception, Amazon. Amazon is eating their lunch. And with Amazon, it's not just electronics and stuff. It is food and stuff. I got friends in America who haven't been to a supermarket in years. They belong to Amazon Prime. They've now got a thing called an Alexis Echo. So when they finish something, they say, is it Alexis? Yeah. They say, Alexis, order me more toilet paper. Two days later, boom, at their door. Alexa, order me salt. And they don't wait till they back it up. They order as and when they need. Because Prime, you pay $100 a year and everything, all delivery is free. All two-day delivery is free. In some of the major areas, such as San Francisco, New York, and others, they're now doing fresh produce, two-hour delivery. I don't know if you've tried to order online from any of our retailers. My advice, don't. It is a painful experience. But what do we also have here? Brand. Woolies. Woolies has brand power. Massive brand power. We know that Ian Moore from Woolies and uh, uh, Whitey Besson from Checkers both go to an abattoir and there's a cow. And one of them buys the left-hand side and one of them buys the right-hand side. And they both go and age it for 28 days, you know, the whole dum dum dum. And then Whitey Besson at ShopRite wraps his in one thin piece of plastic and sells it for 100 bucks a kilo. And Ian Moyer wraps his in five pieces of thick plastic and sells it for 200 bucks a kilo. Which one do I buy? Willie's. Because Willie's is quality, right? I mean, Whitey Besson somewhere is there's a ringing in his ears as he hears me say that. But that's my brand perception. It's what I was raised on. And I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, many moons ago, I buy some milk from Willie's. It's sour. I go on Twitter. I say, Willie's, your milk is sour. 
They're like, boom, how can we help you? I'm not going to just go away my milk is sour. They're like, no, no, tell me. Next thing I know, I've got a phone call. Next thing I know, the manager of my local Willys is at my door with four liters of milk. We're terribly sorry. I'm like, yo, okay, that's a lot of milk, but nonetheless. But even more, I mean, uh, my sister, she buys a lamb's wool jersey. It says quite clearly, hand wash only. Right? There's only one instruction we obey in our entire life. That one that says hand wash only. She puts it in the washing machine. It gets destroyed. She's indignant. I happen to be visiting her. She says, I'm taking this back to Willie's. Do you want to come? I'm like, you bet ya. I want to see someone beat up my sister. Because uh, she scares everyone. I want to see Willie stand up to her and say, no ways. Anyway, so she goes to the counter. She says to the lady behind the counter, and she's very nice and polite. And she says, I bought this lamb's wool jersey. It says hand wash only. I put it in the washing machine. It's destroyed. <laughs> and I stand back waiting for the Woody's lady to tell her off. The Woody's lady says, would you like a replacement or a voucher? So I have to button and explain to the Woody's lady that she's admitting that she made it. <laughs> the Woody's lady says, yeah, we know, but we, she's a customer. We want to keep her happy. So where do I buy my lamb's wool jerseys? <laughs> Woolies. Because even when I'm the idiot, they pay it back. That you can't buy. If you had 50 billion rand, which is market cap or woolies, can you create that in a month, a week, a year? No. That's a lifetime of experience. And that's how we're looking at those sectors and pulling the stocks within it. And then we can start getting more nuanced. So now we say to ourselves, tocos, don't like. Banks, yeah, okay. Happy Tech's interesting. Uh, food retailer. I complete my bias here. You might disagree to me. Woolies and ShopRite. Now we go delve further. Now we've got that broader picture and we start looking into it. So what are the absolute critical? Most important thing is always dividends. Purest form, cash out. The biggest warning in African Bank was that for three years their earnings went up but the dividends went sideways. It's like, hang on guys, you're making more money but you're not giving it back to me. Why? We now know why. Um, we also want profits, headline earnings rising. You want things, in, you don't want a single number, you want a branch of numbers. So it's called leverage. What do you want? Revenue plus 15, operating profit plus 20, HEPs plus 25, dividend plus 30. Those numbers go the right way. Netcare yesterday, pay a dividend out of debt. I actually thought that was illegal. I honestly thought that was breach of companies act. Apparently, you can borrow money to pay dividends. Noit. <laughs> One word, noit. <laughs> so discounted cash flow, if you say to someone in the industry, how do I value a company? They say, easy, discounted cash flow. Welcome to pain. And if you are a CA, you're thinking, that's not hard, that's easy. But to the rest of us, it's really, really hard. Intrinsic valuations, uh, value investing, I like to keep it simple. Gary Boyson, the links are at the bottom. He did a presentation for us and a podcast for us. So this is what he's going to use to identify a company. Now, if you listen to the podcast, he says, you know what? These aren't necessarily written in stone. He's prepared to give them a bit of slip. But what are we looking for? We're looking for increases over nice periods of time. Returns, revenues, earnings, dividends, margins, ROEs. We're looking for shares that exist to be same or decreasing. In other words, they're not using their shares to buy stuff. Then he gets complicated in the PEs, price to books, et cetera, et cetera, uh, your ratios, your long-term debts, and the like. The hard one here is management quality. Great list, but I'll, I'll be honest, hard work. So here's how I do it. I started this process, and I identify the stocks, uh, that one there, and I identify stocks such as Capitec. I identify stocks such as Woolies, uh, City Lodge, uh, Richmond. Um, and I can't think what's in my portfolio. Simonbrown.coza, my whole portfolio is published there. I identify the stock, now I need to know when to buy them. So how do we do that? I'm coming back to this, I'm going to that now. I create a fundamental chart. So what have I done here? I've taken seven years of price earnings ratio as the results came out. So seven years is 14 data points. That's my blue line. I then add the average, which is the red line, and the standard deviation above and below, which is the two green lines. It's just Excel. I mean, it's a bit of work, but it's just Excel. 
And I then say, to me, Willie's is fair value when the forward PE, in other words, next year's earnings into this year's share price, the forward PE is at or below my red line. So the current forward PE on Woolies, 17.7. That red line, 18.1. So at 86 Rand, that says to me, Woolies is interesting. Then I go to the chart. And that chart just says to me, Aish. So that is a weekly chart of Woolies. Initially, what we could see, higher high, high, lower highs, lower lows, looking ugly. Now we're starting to see what could be. We're getting higher highs, higher lows. We might be seeing a turnaround. So maybe this is a space. So I've been buying Woolies. I was buying some at 84. I was buying some at 82.50, which would have been back so about six or so weeks ago. I am smidgens in the profit. I'm not saying it won't go lower. I'm saying I've identified a quality stock that I like and a quality sector that I like. And I think I'm starting to see a bit of support coming through. We could make this chart a lot more complicated. We could bring RSIs and MACDs. Key point is it's a weekly chart. We could bring RSIs and MACDs into that process as well. What are we doing? Wind at our back. We're creating more and more little points of data that say yes. Rather than points of data that say no or unsure. We create more and more that say yes. Are there risks for willies? Of course. There has to be. Risk is what makes profit. So that's the process I use. What I don't do is use any gearing. And then when do I sell? I don't. If you want, you can sell it at the one standard deviation above. So when the forward price earnings is below red, you buy. When it's one standard deviation above, you exit. That move from one to the other can run, it's not going to be less than, 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 than six to 12 months. It's likely going to be two or three years. Here's what I used to do. My fundamentals, very similar to Gary's, which is that list there. Mine was very similar, where it was a case of, I want growth in HEPs, I want growth in dividend, I want return in equity in the top of its peers. In other words, compare ShopRite, Spa, uh, uh, Pick and Pay, Willys, and I want it to be, the, it doesn't have to be number one, but it has to be number one or two. If it's number four, I'm not interested. Identify with that. The technical, so then you identify it, then you wait. Price above 200 exponential moving average, EMA. I always use EMAs. I want you to my RSI vanilla going on the weekly from below to above 30. Standard stock, standard RSI. And then I said, cool, entry, close above 21 EMA. Exit, close below 21, weak. So my entry is aggressive at that point. My exit is not. The 21 week will get you into trades that can run potentially four years. If you look at the commodity bull cycle uh, of, of up to 2008, if you look at the bank cycle, forget the, the, the resources, look at the bank bull cycle in the 90s and again in the 2000s. <coughs> Um, if you look at those, those sort of things that ran for five, six, seven years, that got you in, not for all five, six, or seven, it got you in for two, three, or four of those years. And your returns were in the hundreds. And I didn't gear them. Because I want the time on my side. I want to be able to stay if I need as long as possible. So you get that list of fundamentally strong stocks. And that's your go long list. And then you wait for the signals. You're fundamentally weak. Go short list. I said already, do we really want to be shorting? That's your call. To me, I focus on that part there. What's important is we still need the system, the plan, the discipline, the risk management, the perfect trades. Just because maybe we have now brought some fundamentals in doesn't mean that we can abandon the cornerstone of what trading is. Discipline. That is still the most important part of the whole press process. Discipline, you know, the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Consistency of action. Discipline of the mind. Discipline does a couple of things. It means that what works is repeatable because we've got examples of it working. It also means, and I've talked about this in a couple of the videos, um, your, your unconscious competence. We all drive. I'm taking a flying assumption there, but we drive cars. The first time we drove a car, it was hard and difficult, and we stalled it and almost crashed. Now we do it without thinking. Why? Because we have changed gears 
hundreds of thousands of times. And we've changed gears the same way every time. Because when we didn't change gears the same way, something happened, right? There was a clunking noise that came out of the engine, or the revs went through the roof, or we stalled the car. There's really only one way to change a gear. And we all do it perfectly. Because we've done it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And that's where we need our trading to get to. Go check if you're on just one lap, look for perfect trade. You'll find the list we talk about the perfect trade and what that is if you've missed that video. But we still need, just because we're bringing in some fundamentals doesn't mean we can now say, ah, we're fast and loose. No, no, no. The process is still critical. The plan is still critical. And the discipline is paramount. Whatever we are, traders, investors, or blend of, the thing that probably serves us best is the ability to do nothing. To sit and wait. Sometimes for weeks and weeks on end, maybe months, maybe a year. But to do nothing. And we get itchy fingers, hey, because this trading thing is fun. or well, not the losing money part. We want to do it. Now, if you want to have fun, Soweto, cooling towers, jump off a 55-meter water tower. That is fun. Actually, no, it's just plain damn scary. But you get the point. So it comes back to, and I've kept this slide from last time, which was the same from the time before because it is so critically important. It comes back to having a plan. We can have multiple plans. I have a lazy plan, which I trade in two different ways. I have a momentum plan. I have my investing plan, which I've just showed you how I... And that is it. You know, I, I do not do DCFs or any of that. Well, what I just showed you around identifying stocks is basically my process. Okay, maybe a little more time in the process. Maybe bouncing some ideas off some friends, uh, some looks at, at stuff. But I'm not going and doing discounted cash flows. I'm not doing uh, 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 net future projected values and the like. To me, there's too much guessing into that. Uh, guessing's a bad word. There's too many assumptions I have to make. And as soon as I'm making assumptions, I'm the weak point. And in the DCF, I've got to make five assumptions. That's five weak points. Now, Serpa Modiba will tell you, yes, but then when you're wrong, you know where you were wrong. Great point. Except that I fear I would be wrong on all five. Serpa is only wrong on one because he's way smart. Always be learning, always be asking. I come back to that always. This is a process. I've been in this game for 34 years. I inherited shares in the early 80s. This morning, we had an hour with Roland Rousseau, and I had my head blown on things that I learned. We never get there and say, hey, we know it all. No. Nah. Always learning, always asking. Next week, we're going to risk... Perhaps the most important part of the process, I left it for the end for a bunch of reasons. I'll, we'll talk about what, sorry, not next week, next month. We'll talk about why we're hitting risk. In particular, I'll talk about it then. But risk is massively important. And there's a lot of different aspects to risk as well. Um, and the homework remains the same. The homework is, what do you need to do? You need to create an overall strategy, which may include multiple different trading systems. Some may be geared, some may not. They might have different providers. They might have different methodologies. That's all well and good. But you need to create these, and they're not going to happen overnight. What we have done, this now being the 11th in the series, is help you on that path. But you've got to make the decisions. You've got to decide what sort of trader you want to be. You've got to decide how much hours and effort you want to put in. You've got to decide that blend that you want to do. Now, I can give you a trading system. Go to Just One Lap, search Lazy Trading System. There it is, 56-minute video, boom, done, end of story. But it doesn't work like that because we've got our own fears. We've got our own desires. We've got our own uh, uh, interests. We've got, you know, I do my entries at 9.30 on a Monday morning, but maybe at 9.30 on a Monday morning, I don't know, you're tending to the wine farm. So you can take something and adapt it, but you've got to do that process. This is not just silver platter, here it is. You know, you don't want the system. Just put a billion rand in my bank, actually, no. Put a billion dollars in my bank, actually. Make it Swiss francs. A billion Swiss francs in my account. That's what we want. Not going to happen. Keep on coming back to why. Why are you doing it? Not because it's wrong, because it's important we know. 
And if we keep on asking ourselves why, we know that we've at least done a good process to get to where we are, rather than just randomly forward falling it in. Emotions, we've done that one, which was psychology. Risk, we're coming to strategy. We've a couple of them touched on it this evening, being one of them. Discipline, we spent most of this entire session on discipline. The key trait of anyone entering the market is discipline. Otherwise, you're going to crash and burn. Your exposure, which is risk and leverage, we've touched on, and knowledge. And I bring my list of books back again, just because everyone should be reading books, and those are a bunch that I think, yeah, there's hundreds out there. I think there are, are half a dozen books that are a great place to start. Uh, the last two are less. So super forecasting, is, as it suggests, thinking fast and slow is more how the brain works which is important, then it is going to teach you about trading. Trading in the zone, financial freedom, trading room, top three, out and out trading, reminiscence of a stock operator, more again about process, how to think, how to manage when things go horribly wrong. And they went very, very horribly wrong for him, repeatedly. And then we're back again 21 June, last in this series, kick a new series off in July. Typically, when someone says fundamentals and technicals, the knee-jerk response is no. I think there's a good argument to say, hang on, let's step back and interrogate this. I think most times we should step back and interrogate. I think this is certainly a place. Oh, is there a place for it? Yes, we can be an aggressive Aussie trader trading SA40 in a five-minute chart. We can have our long-term stock that we bought and we put in our bottom drawer and we check it once every 50 years. But that doesn't mean we can't do this as well. And I like, to me, intuitively, the concept works. Identify quality, buy it at the right time. That's what fundamentals and technicals is doing. Otherwise, we're doing only one half of an equation. Now, your five-minute chart where you're trading SA40, nah, don't, do not, don't, do not bring your fundamentals into that. That stays pure technicals. But there's certainly a space for it here. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time this evening.